There's only three things as humans we can train. We can train our craft, we can train our body, and we can train our mind. The best of the best are not leaving the training of the mind up to chance. Confidence is a skill. Being calm is a skill. It would be a mistake to think that if you don't prepare yourself with the training of those skills, it would happen one day. So you did it. You finally did the book. I, did it, I know. How's it feel? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I mean, it was, it's anticlimactic in every sense of the way, meaning that all this work goes into it. Mm -hmm. And then at the other side of it, it's like um, being able to share it is the cool part. Yes. But that feels anticlimactic. Yeah. Uh, meaning that there's no kind of big bang. Yes. It's, yeah. So the feeling, you know, to your point is like, there's not like a big thing. It's like there, there was a mm. moment when it was like the first day it was out to yeah. see that first week to see kind of the, the traction that it had. But um, well, books are different than like movies or something, right? Where most people see it when it comes out. Mm. Right. So like like a movie, it has like a, a several month run in a theater or opening weekend matters. But books take a long time. Like people, even, most of the books that I read are not new. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, I, I right. get a, you get around to them yeah, right. and usually they have to like sort of, they have to be like filtered through people that you like or admire. Like yeah. I, I almost never read books when they come out, right? Like somebody certainly, says, certainly yeah. not the week they came out because yeah. I have other shit that I'm reading. Yeah. That's interesting. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so even, it, even if I, <clears throat> even if I buy it when it comes out, it goes in the pile and then you get around to it later. Yeah. So like that as an author, you've, been, too. Yeah. you've been working on this thing for like years and years. Yeah. And then you're like, what do you think? And people are like, it's on my to-do list. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, <come on. laughs> like, like I, it's going to take, it takes hours. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> it, it, it is so true because um, my wife hasn't read it yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I understand. Yeah. yeah. I really understand. Uh, my, I don't think my wife reads any of my books anymore. She's like, You've done like 12. She's like, I can't read all of them. It's, yeah, too, right. it's too many. I live with you. Yeah. Sure, sure. First, she's like, yeah, I heard you talking about it for like four years as you were working on it. And then also I read it. I read an early draft and then I read this chat. Like, I'm not, it's not like a new thing to me that I'm yeah. excited to find out. <laughs> <laughs> I good. think that's healthy. Yeah. It's like, uh, like in sports, they have to come to every game. Like you've been doing this the entire time. They have to come it's to a, every it's game. It's a little different, but yeah, I mean, there's such electricity at a sporting event, but yeah, <laughs> point taken. So I love this idea in the book. You open with this idea of, uh, what's FOPO? Mm -hmm. Fear of what yeah. other people think. Fear of people's opinion. Fear of people's opinions. I love that idea. And actually, there's a bunch of st stoic quotes about this exact topic. Would yeah. you believe that? So my favorite from Marcus, which I actually remember thinking about when The Obstacle is the Way came out. So, so thinking about how books come out and then what they do. The Obstacle is the Way came out. It did okay the first week. It didn't like blow the doors off. It wasn't a failure. It did okay. And then it got skunked from the bestseller list. It should have hit it, but it didn't. Mm. And it did not hit for five additional years. So it took five years uh, to hit a bestseller list. I, I mean, I never would have known that. Yeah, it took forever. It's in, the, it's to in hit the just New York about Times every list. locker room I've been in. Yeah, it, and it, it was selling very well, but the sort of recognition for the thing was delayed by five years. Oh, that's years. interesting. Um, yeah. But I remember thinking of this quote when it came out, which is um, from Marcus Aurelius. He says, uh, we love ourselves more than other people. We're all sort of inherently self-interested at the end of the day, or right? we have this natural instinct towards self-preservation. He says, we love ourselves more than other people, but we care about other people's opinions more than our own. And he didn't mean that like, you know, we, we care about other people's you know feelings, we're empathetic. What he's saying is that we work really hard on something. We know that it's good. And we know that it's the best thing that we've ever done. And then we put it out and then we go, did I do a good job? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, am I, am, okay? I, am I worth it? Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Did I just waste my time? Right. What, you know? Yeah. And so you turn around and you, you hand over the value of the thing to total strangers who are busy, who are biased, who don't even know you exist. And then, and then you wonder why you feel shitty after you put something out. That's it. And, and then if you attach your identity to it as well. Mm -hmm. It's so now it's not just about like, do you value the product, but do you value me? Because you've yes. commingled identity with the performance of whatever matters to you. Yes. And that it's a it's a really dangerous proposition to go through life that way. It's the most dangerous mm -hmm. because 
in the creative fields or the athletic fields or whatever, you're so vulnerable. You have to, you're like this, you're putting yourself out there and you're doing it in front of other people. If the crowd gets to decide, you know, like the gladiator games, like thumbs up, thumbs down, you get, I mean, you're not going to make it. That's like right. yeah. you have to be doing it from some sort of independent place of self-assessment, not, uh, do they love me or not? Yeah. Crowdsourcing a sense of self Yeah, again, right? Very dangerous. And, and I, the, I think the most powerful people, and I don't mean that in an obtuse way, but yeah. people that have a sense, a real sense of self yeah. is that the external world doesn't dictate their internal experience. Yes. So the external world is happening. It could be thumbs up or thumbs down. It could be jeering or booing or whatever it is. Right. Celebrations. That is noise to the signal. And the signal is, was I true to my thoughts, words, and actions? Was I was I yes. true to my first principles? Yeah. Did I bring my best efforts into? So that that inside out is really what we're pointing to in the book. Yes. And that's, so the title is the first rule of mastery, yeah. but the subtitle is stop worrying about what people think. Yes. That's not the first rule. So I thought that you would pick that up. Okay, so the, the uh, fear of what other people think is not the first rule of mastery. No. Okay. So like, let's say the first rule of health is to stop drinking poison. Sure. You'd say, yeah, that's yeah, pretty good if you're drinking poison. Like yeah. that sounds like a good first rule. Put yeah. the poison down. Yeah. I think the poison that we're drinking is this outsourcing of sense. Uh, the poison that we're drinking is the outsourcing of self. Mm -hmm. Is So like, am I okay in the eyes of others? Yeah. And we're drinking it all day long. Our brains yes. are wired for it. Socially, the the need to belong is like in the fabric of how we organize ourselves. Yeah, and we've gotten lazy. Yes, and the laziness is I don't know if I'm okay. I haven't done the the inner work. So what do you think? Well, it's a good like what the crowd thinks, what the market thinks, what sales are, the awards. These are good heuristics of did you do a good job? But but they're not perfect. I would say it's a good heuristic to. Um, did I tap into what they, the, the whatever they is like? Yeah. And so there's there's a utility in that, but it doesn't mean that it's honest to you. Yes. Right. And and I just mean like it's a, it's a crude metric. So people use it instead of doing the work. That's right. To figure out I'm what a better a better metric yeah. is, right? Because like like for in sports, winning and losing is obviously very important or you don't get to do it anymore. Like if you lose all the time, uh, that's not great. And they'll probably find, they'll probably try to replace you with someone who they think will win more. NFL right? stands for not for long. Yeah. And so, so that's a reality of it, it but fast. you, the weird thing is when you find people who are really great at what they do and have won a lot is they're actually usually measuring themselves day to day on something usually more strict or more individualistic than what does the box score say or what are the announcers like you 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 find that they they're operating on a whole other level of standards that tends to correlate to winning and losing more often than not but it's also independent of those things. So they could be- A thousand percent. They could be really pumped uh, with how they did on a game that they lost, and they could feel pretty good about themselves on a game. No, sorry. They, yeah, they could feel uh, bad when they lost, bad when they won, and good when they lost, right? They could feel, because they're the offering something yeah, else. If the tuning fork is honest to their very best. Yes. So if the tuning fork is tuned to the approval of others yeah. or the outcome, then then the those two matter more so yes. so the tuning fork when you're tuned to yourself and you know and it's actually not that hard like you we know sure. when we're lying sure yeah. <laughs> all marketers right yeah. Yeah. like we know when we're telling the truth we know when we've conformed just a tiny bit for approval we know it yeah we know when something feels a bit overwhelming and we choose something to numb it yeah social or drugs or whatever like we know so that it's just, it's just like ringing the bell to like the signal to noise, mm -hmm. like have the tuning fork be to the signal, not to the noise. And I love that you're pointing out like how the strong, you know, the extraordinary performers work because it's not, it's not as clean as we might think. So the, the true performers might not be the seven best in the league, Yeah, right? They could be middle of the pack, barely hanging on because they're not six foot eight, 265 sure. pounds and jump 42 inches, but they are so pure in their approach. 
Yeah. And they've got the signal to noise ratio right, but we just don't know them because they don't get airtime. Same yes. with, you know, a single parent in the middle of somewhere that, you know, has two kids, three kids and no history of college and they are figuring out the most creative lifestyle that you can imagine to with purpose. But we don't know how to herald them and support them and like honor them because they're not on TV and they're not on the radio or whatever it might be. Yeah, we're all sort of graded on this curve that is our own potential, right? Yes. And uh, it's hard to take someone whose success is totally a, a, a matter of their own individual circumstances and context and hold them up as an example and say, we should all be like this person because we don't necessarily relate to that, right? That's so right. That's um, right. it's easier to go like, this is the athlete that's won the most games. This is the entrepreneur that's made the most money. That's why I said, it's this sort of crude metric. Like it makes sense, but it, it leaves so much out and it leaves so many other people feeling like they're failures because they're not that. But actually, you know, again, graded on this curve, you're crushing it because you've done so much more than like, like it, it's like, it, it's not how long you live necessarily. It's how long, like when you were born, the moment in time you were born, the genetics you have, the class that you're in, the country, all these things determine what your life expectancy is. So if your life expectancy was 40 and you lived to be 60, you crushed it, mm. but you might look at someone who's 110 and be like, they, they did so much better than me. And it's totally different. And then you add the, the secondary, probably more important um, variable there is the quality. Like, yes, sure. Did, did you sure. live the quote unquote good life? Yes. Right. Did right. you have a fire in your belly and did you really lean in? Yeah, are you 110 and miserable or are you 60 and you feel like you it? left it all on the yeah, table? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that, that's a real thing for many of, of us. Of course. You know, so, and, you know, the other thing is like with elite athletics and sport is you might want to have some of like the ones that you know their names, right? Yeah. You might want to have them over for dinner once. Sure. Yes. <laughs> you realize it comes at a cost to be that way. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, like there's an exciting thing that happens with all of that attention, but... Uh, it tends to be a lot about them. Yeah, sure. And sure. maybe the interests are not exactly aligned. Yeah. And, you know, and I say that with some jest because certainly narcissism works in the world of elite anything. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not saying true narcissistic personality disorder. I'm yeah. saying that yeah. excessive narcissism. But the, the, they don't have it buttoned up the way you might or we might think. Sure. They're working too. Yeah. You know, they're working to know if they're okay. And it was one of the origins of like, why write this book is because um, I was embarrassed as a young kid. I was 16 years old. I saved up a couple summers to get my first truck, Mazda B2000, and you know, it was like three grand or something. And um, and I'm driving, and I'm brand new at driving. And I remember I was I was I was traveling in the in in a direction. There was a lane next to me traveling in the same direction, and there's a car coming up on me. It's yeah. gonna slowly pass me. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look cool in this thing. Yeah. So I grabbed the steering wheel. I kind of got that cool kid lean, sure. you know. And I'm like, when they look over, yeah, they're gonna see a cool kid. In here. Yeah, they didn't look over, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I had this moment, like, what did I just do? Yeah, what is all of that? Sure, that I just like pretended, and I wanted, I didn't know this person, and I was shape shifting in a way to look cool. Yeah, and. I was so embarrassed. I knew that that was not the good way, yeah. the, the right way to go through life. Like, yeah. I, I knew that and I was embarrassed by it. I didn't have anyone to talk to about it because, and then I I didn't really change. Right. Like I was still doing it. And then come to find out with many of the world's best that I've been fortunate to learn with and from and work with, they too have a similar mechanism where they say, I don't want to let people down. Yeah. Man, I don't want to blow it. I don't want to look stupid. You know, like, looks. So I've got to show up because coach and agent, da, 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 are yeah. counting on me. And they hold the power whether I get to do my life the way I want to do it. So this opinion of other people is a real thing. When I wrote The Daily Stoic eight years ago, I had this crazy idea that I would just keep it going. The book was 366 meditations, but I'd write one more every single day and I'd give it away for free as an email. I thought maybe a few people would sign up. Couldn't have even comprehended a future in which three quarters of a million people would get this email every single day and would for almost a decade. If you want to get the email, if you want to be part of a community that is the largest group of Stoics ever assembled in human history, I'd love for you to join us. You can sign up and get the email totally for free. No spam. You can unsubscribe whenever you want at dailystoic.com slash email.
Yeah, it's uh, that's one of the things about imposter syndrome, which I've, I've talked about before, but it's like sure. there is this belief that people are paying a lot closer attention to you than they possibly could be. I mean, even like yeah. on a football team, like you get this sense like, oh, the coach is out to get me or whatever. It's like, there's 52 players. Like they're not thinking about you at all, really, yeah, right? Like, right. Yeah, like right. most yeah. of the time they're thinking about so many other things. They're thinking about travel arrangements. They're thinking about what people are thinking about. You, you have this sense that the spotlight is on you and that is your sort of ego and your natural narcissism that, that because it's so important to you, you assume it's important to everyone else. And it, it's just, it's not that they're, it's it's not that there isn't any attention on you and that the stakes aren't high and that you don't have to perform, but it's just not as intense as you sometimes think it is. And I, I know you're well aware of the spotlight effect. Yeah. You know, uh, Professor Gilovich like coined that term by just basically finding that this is a fun experiment. Can yeah. I talk about mm -hmm. the experiment? Yeah. So um, he, he's got about 100 kids sitting in or kids. Um, freshman college, yeah. usually. Right. And so they're sitting in a, a, in a classroom or auditorium. And he's got a handful of other students that he says, okay. Um, and no one's in on, the, on yeah. the experiment here. Everyone's part of the experiment, but they're not sure of their roles. And so these uh, handful of kids, he gives uh, a the epitome of like uncool. And he gives them a shirt, the Barry Manilow, yeah. like yeah. a big Barry Manilow shirt on it. Which is and, probably cool uh, now it's, again. It's, yeah, right. Now yeah, it's yeah, come back yeah, around. Yeah. But at the yeah. time, you know, you yeah. can see, the, sure. you can see the, the freshman going, you want me to wear this in front of my friend? Like, yeah, sure. you want me to walk in there? Yeah. And like, yeah, well, and by the way, what percentage of people do you think are going to notice? And the ones that are wearing the shirt are like, oh, yeah. Yeah, right. A hundred percent. Oh, man. Like, sure. I got to walk in front of the class in this yeah. shirt. And then so then they asked uh, the group of hundred, how many, you know, how many of you noticed sure. people walking with the ugly shirt? Yeah. And it was like 25%. Yeah. Someone in that range. So we overestimate gra with a grandiosity about yes. our our level of importance and so he dubbed it like the spotlight effect so i've got a spotlight on me thinking about what do you think of my yes. hair and my t-shirt and what i'm saying and you've got a spotlight on you thinking about your hair and yeah. your t-shirt so like we're these spotlights not casting on each other but like casting yes. on ourselves walking around i remember what, there was another study that i read about and it was talking about how like in middle school to high school you kids start to pick up this thing. They coined it like the imaginary audience, which is that you start to think everyone's sort of watching and following you. It's just like this sort of developmental, you're becoming aware of all the things that you were not necessarily aware of when you were younger and you were a kid and you were just free and you didn't care and you, you couldn't be embarrassed. You sort of pick that up. And that's why like, yeah, your pants rip in high school and you think like my life is over because right, yeah. you think people are paying way more attention than they are, which of course they aren't. And the argument was one of the dangerous things about social media is that kids are now picking that up at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so the imaginary audience, instead of being this developmental phase that you grow out of, just becomes permanently infused with your personality, which is that you really do think you're you're performing all the time. And I think anyone who has an audience or has done things, it, it is disorienting and destabilizing. Like it's not normal or good for you to have an actual fan base, right? Because now there are these people that you think about and that takes you out of what you're supposed to be doing, which is hitting a ball or writing a movie or what you're, you're supposed to be thinking about the thing, but instead you're thinking about the thing and part of you is also going, but do they like me? What do they think? And so yep. it, we, we know that fame is this, sort of toxic thing and people talk about it all the time. The problem is like now everyone else is getting their own version of it. And so it's, it's heightened. Like you see totally regular people that are like, you know, posing for their family photos, not for the Christmas card, but for social media. And, and it's sort of taking you out of the moment that you're in and you're, you're turns you into a performer in your own life. Yeah. Your, your highlight reel, yes. you know, on, on public display. And so the other thing that happens is the imaginary audience is now real. Yes. And you, we, we've always been public figures. Yeah. Like if you think about like you had a family and a couple neighbors and you, you had a small town. 30 yeah. some kids in a classroom or maybe 15, whatever sure. it might be. And you, so we were community members. Mm -hmm. We all are. At, yeah. Unless you're, you're like run by wolves or something yeah. like <laughs> So we've always been quote unquote public, but it's the extrapolation of the size of it and then the, the not knowing, not being able to have a tactile feedback loop about do I fit in the tribe or not? Yeah. And that fitting in the tribe is foundational to safety. Like yes. 
yeah. that goes back a couple hundred thousand years because sure. if you and i were in the tribe right yeah. and and we're going out and hunting or gathering or doing what we're doing and we're screwing up and yeah. we're not performing and we're actually a distraction when we come back the elders are going to say hey ryan like yeah, you don't want to be the weirdo you you got to go yeah you're out yeah so listen we're giving you a warning yeah Give you a second warning. Yeah. Hey, listen. Okay, this is the last warning. Yeah. And then we keep the behavior that's not tuned to the tribe. Yeah. You two got to go. Yeah. Now that's a near death sentence. Yeah. So that's why we are so tuned. Ancient brain and modern times were so tuned to the just hint of yeah. rejection mm -hmm. because that was a near death sentence. Yeah. So that's why when people, what's what's the greatest fear for most people? Public speaking, walking on stage, yeah. those four little steps, sure. right? They get greater than death. Greater the, than the death. Jerry Seinfeld joke is the, the number one. The number one fear is public speaking, and the number two fear is death. And he says, "So most people would rather be in the casket than delivering the eulogy." It's so good, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. 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 So, but why is that? Is because we, our ancient brain, modern yeah. times, we have fused who we are yeah. with what we do, sure. and then what we do is in the public court of opinion, yeah. as opposed. So that's all noise. Yeah. That's why it's, and look, there's no sniper in row 14 in yeah. most, <laughs> sure. know, most even sure. public speaking events, mm -hmm. but the eyeballs are really dangerous yeah. because if they don't like me, then maybe I don't matter. Yeah. And maybe I'm going to be kicked out of this tribe and I don't know how I'll fend for myself. Yes. That's actually not how modern life works though. Sure. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So, yeah. but it's still in our ancient brain. Yes. And it's as, as you would recognize David Foster Wallace says, you know, the, the old fish and the two young fish, you know, like the old fish swims by and says uh, to the two young fish, like, how's the water, boys? You know, and the two young fish don't say anything for a while and swim away. And then one brave young fish says to the other one, the hell is water? Right. Right. You're just used to it. So that so the water that we swim in mm -hmm. so, is is so, is so obvious to the elder. Yes. And that's what we're trying to point out is the water we're swimming in is really the poison of needing approval from others. Yes. Now, the subtitle is Stop Care Stop Worrying. Yes. It's not titled Stop Caring. Sure. We do need to care sure. about some people's opinions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like your boss, yeah. oftentimes, like could be one of the important ones. I'm I don't have my supervisor in there. I have I, I'm an entrepreneur, yeah. so that yeah. makes it, it's my wife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's my supervisor. No, look at if, if you like I was saying, if you sell zero copies of your book, you won't be able to do it again. Permission aside, you did it for someone other than yourself by definition. Otherwise, it would have looked very different. You wouldn't have put a cover on it. You wouldn't have edited it so closely. I, I it didn't would look like the cover, by yeah, the way, right? right? Like, but I just mean it would, it would be your it would be it would be your diary. Like that's exactly all right. Art is by definition for some the audience also right so that's interesting i've never heard that i just because i haven't thought about that yeah. way so can can you, I mean, you de the, deconstruct that a little bit yeah i mean look uh you, you're doing it for yourself you're trying to fulfill your vision but you're conscious of an audience existing or you would do it very that's differently the, i think that that's the civil war inside for for the committed creative is this true and honest, or is this for approval? Well, I just think people people aren't being honest when they go like, I just make it for me. And it's like, really, that's why the sitcom you made is exactly 23 minutes. Like uh, it's 23 minutes because that's the format that it fits in television so they could sell slots so for advertisers. Then you're like, saying the meta, but it, so I think some of the most creative athletes are the ones that have to figure out how to be creative in the constraints of yes. the system. Yes. So you're saying even the meta, the system is designed for approval. Yeah. I, so yes, football like, games are less than three hours. Yeah, I just, I just design. mean like you are, if you're like, oh, I, I just play for the love of the game. Then you'd be playing alone in a park at 2 a.m. Like you're, you're, you're also in it for winning and for team. And, like and, it's a and, whole and thing. And money is part of the economy. Of course, like, of course. It's, it's definitely part of it. Like how I would do the books if I was the only audience would be very different than if, you know, like I, it, it would be, I would be writing in shorthand to myself. Actually, this is what's so incredible That's about, cool. I don't know if I have, what's so incredible about Mark Cerullis' Meditations and why it is an unprecedented book is that it's maybe By the, the way, only- like what you've done here, like it's ridiculous, dude. Like it's really ridiculous. There's, honestly, what you've done here, like, so I, hold on, before okay. we get to your point, okay. like I've got to just like, let me go back to like, uh, uh, let's see, when, 1990, Three. When I graduate, 1992. Okay. I graduated uh, college in 94, and I 
uh, minored in philosophy. Yeah. And so we go through all the different types and, you know, it's not just one class, but it's a minor. So I'm into it. Yeah. And the Stoics, this is 92. And I'm like, man, these guys like they're, they're onto something like that's yeah, different sure. now. Like, I love this idea. And, um, and it was always working in the background of my approach. Sure. So as a licensed psychologist, like there's philosophy in there somewhere, of course. right? There's a yeah. course, best practices, evidence-based, da, da, da. And it's always kind of been in there. And then I come across you <laughs> and I'm like, holy shit, this is so good. And like, you have just caught the attention of literally like the sport world and, 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 and it's, dude, I just want to say, it's rare to put philosophy on front stage and you've done it and well, you've done you. it in a great way. And I hope that you have monetized <laughs> it as well in, the, in all the ways that that celebration can happen. Like I'm so stoked for what you've done well, and how, you. how, how people are um, finding in your community, a new way to take control of their, their well-being. Well, thank you. Well, yeah, I, what I was saying about Marcus, what's incredible about meditation is that it's one of the only books, certainly one of the only philosophy books, that's not written with an audience in mind. It's his private thoughts. So, you know, that he goes and like... Frank, kind of... Yes, of course. Yeah. Also, also an incredible book. Uh, uh, listen, I do not want to spar with, about authors with you. So. <laughs> no, no. But, but what I'm saying is that very few books survive to us that were not intended to be books. Yeah, that's cool. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so like, there's there's little... And, and you can see in, in the book, there's obviously things where he's writing to himself you know he goes like like that customs agent that i met so and he doesn't he doesn't explain or elaborate so he's only he would know what that means and if you were writing for an audience you would phrase it differently you'd be yeah. like in you know the year 162 ad we were traveling you would sell the story he is and it's also it's not sequential it's just bulleted basically bulleted number. We don't know how he did it, but it's it's just a jumble of thoughts because it was his journal yeah, to right. himself. It, he was practicing the philosophy, which happens to be a writing. So for him, meditation was having a conversation with himself about these ideas, sort of reminding himself of things. How did that go from private journal to We don't commercial? know. We don't know. It, basically, he dies in the, the towards the end of uh, the second century AD. Somebody sold and, them out. Now. So, and right, probably assumed it would be yeah. destroyed or, and then we don't hear about it again for like several hundred years. And then it doesn't, it doesn't emerge as like a major philosophical text for many centuries after that, uh, as the Western texts are sort of rediscovered. I mean, we have this thing called the dark ages where we forget about everything. Yeah. And so, so, um, he 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 would probably be mortified that we're talking about it now. But for him, the the process of the philosophy was writing to himself about it, and then that survives to us. So there's something very specific and very unique about it that makes it general and and relatable. But but the point is, I would never write a sentence like that because I am writing for publication. That's the nature of the world we live in. If you were to look at my journal, though, my diary, it's very different. I'm writing that totally to myself, um, and it's all about things that only I know about, right? Mm -hmm. And so the definition, uh, when an artist is sitting down uh, to make something, th there's a choice you're making at that very beginning with how you present yourself, how you talk, how you, that that is inherently admitting that it's for more than just you. Yeah, it's it's gotta be for you, of course, but you're also, it's fundamentally for you. So I like your point, it's not, don't worry about it, but you still have to care. Yeah, so you're pointing at the exact center of the internal civil war, the internal crisis, the internal sense of self. Yeah. And what I want to just highlight here is that there are micro choices that we're making. Yeah. And those micro choices are made in context mm -hmm. to the neighborhood, to the culture, to yeah. the era, all of that. But it's the context that um, this this other context that I think is really important is that how clear are you to your virtues? your core values, your first principles. So if you bundle those together, virtues, values, and, and first principles, and if those are really clear, you've got some bellwethers. Mm -hmm. And then if you've got a purpose lined up, that you're clear about your life purpose or your monthly purpose or your purpose while on the team or sure. purpose of, of a role that you inhabit as maybe a father or son or whatever. So it, those are those are the two big ones that that help guide the micro choices. And then if you can, inside of that context, you can access the thing that you want to express. Yes. 
And if you've got a well-refined craft, like you've got range. Mm -hmm. And if it's if if you're new at it, there's less range. Well, and and I think you care about what the audience thinks, about what the crowd thinks, about what your coaches think, about what the sports writers think, whatever your, your domain, you have to care about customers uh, in a capitalistic society. That, But you don't have to to go to Marcus's quote about how we, we love ourselves, but we love other people's opinions more than our own. You just can't care about their opinion more than your own opinion. So like if, like if I set out to write a book that's about a certain topic in a certain style, Obviously, I, I think that's going to resonate with an audience and I want it to resonate with the audience. But if what the audience wants is this totally different thing that doesn't interest me or doesn't excite me, or my editor says, well, what if you did this? I think it, I have to measure that or check that against my values and my intentions. And I have to decide what's more important to me. And ultimately, what you think and what you want to do should be the sort of North Star creatively and professionally. You, otherwise, you're this sort of finger to the wind person who doesn't stand for anything. And fundamentally, whatever you make is insincere and hollow, right? Like we want a politician to do what they think is right. Of course, we want to be in alignment a lot of the times, but but if someone's only doing what the, what the polls are saying in a given moment, we also don't respect and like that person, right? So you have to, you care, but not too much. And then we can sift down. I have a round table of eight. Yeah, That's, like your sort of board of advisors. Yeah, so those eight um, that earned a right at my table, mm -hmm. those are the ones that I palpate first. Sure. So tuning fork internal yes. against um, virtues and purpose. And I'm going to get to the purpose in a minute. Then, then the next external signal is that eight. Yeah. And to have a seat at the table for me, you can have any any level of discernment you want of who makes the, the table. Mine is quite simple. Is one they care yeah they've demonstrated that they know my scars they know my traumas they know my ambitions they know my hopes and dreams like they've invested time sure. under tension yeah and so i need that yeah right so that's the first so that, that that way when i say hey ryan you know if you're, if you're at the table what do you think about this yeah that you, it's not just an opinion it's actually thoughtfully contextually embraced like for you mike i might do something different but for you yes and then the second variable is they understand and they've embodied living in a high stress public yes. amphitheater where it's like that context is really important as sure. well. So those are the two variables to me. It's like you've done some shit yeah, and you've got time under tension in this relationship where I know you also care and yeah. I care in return. So Well, and I think that's so important too, right? Because feedback is a central part of life, that's right? right. But if you don't know what you're trying to do, uh, if you don't know your purpose, you're at the mercy of potentially incorrect or, uh, you know, inappropriate or ill-timed feedback, right? And so feedback can be very, very dangerous. Yes, there's right. There's low performance feedback, high performance feedback, there's inaccurate, there's that, like, you want to be, ve you want to have a, almost create a sanctuary of the people that, where you get the feedback from. Yes, because you have to know, well, here's what I'm trying to do. So I'm going to take the parts of that feedback and then I, I'm comfortable, confident, ignoring the stuff that's well-intentioned, maybe even right in other circumstances. But for what I'm trying to do, you know, uh, don't make sense. And here's even one more layer of complication of like those folks. Many of our closest people like who we are in reflection to who they are. Sure. You see where I'm going yeah. with this? So let's say that you and I are trying to sort something out and um, I make 100,000 and you make $100,000 and or yeah. you make 102 yeah. and I make 98. Yeah. So yeah. we're in some range here. And and you say, hey, Mike, what do you think? I'm thinking about this thing. And that's going to put you on the map to like 100 million. Yeah. And I say, ah, I don't know. Like that doesn't seem quite right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. Like it's not because like, it's not because the idea isn't right. It's because I'm I'm presenting that the idea is not right, but it's really because I don't want to feel a kind of way around you. Yeah. So that reflection of I'm comfortable, I like you because we're kind of close in how we live our lives. And Yeah, your friend comes to you with advice saying, hey, I'm thinking about moving across the country to take this other job. Same it might thing. be great for them, but you're yeah. inherently threatened or saddened by the idea that they were getting up and leaving. And then what does it say about you for staying? It's this whole, it, we're very complicated people. That's right. 
I remember I, I gave a talk to the Pirates one time, the Pittsburgh Pirates, and they I was walking around spring training when they were telling me they had this interesting rule, which I, I have thought a lot about since. They were saying one of the rules in the organization is you can't go up to a guy and give feedback. Like you can't give feedback to an athlete unless you have a relationship with that person. That's right. Because they don't want just somebody going around and meddling, not knowing what that what that person is working on, not knowing what feedback they just got from somebody else 10 minutes ago, not knowing how that person responds to feedback, what they're, what's the most conducive way to get feedback. So, you know, information could be correct, but it's lacking the context needed for it to be successful. And so there was this idea of like, you got to give people space and you got to respect each person's sort of individual sanctuary, especially in a kind of a training or a developmental environment you can't just go around willy nilly, just you know, sort of uh, firing feedback out because it, oh, it's, it could it's, do more harm than good. Oh, it's great! And so that's I was nine seasons at the Seattle Seahawks, and we built a we had a lot of winning 2012 to 2021. We had a lot of winning and yeah. two Super Bowls. One we won in dramatic Almost, fashion, yes. and one, <laughs> I like where you go first. One we lost in dramatic <laughs> yeah. fashion as well. But there was a lot of winning going on, and we were we only talked about winning once mm. a year. So we were not an outcome focused and we we had a really favorable, you know, yeah. um, it's rare to get to the Super Bowl. Like sure. there's some clubs in the NFL that have never been. And so we we were what um, we put a tall tent pole. Wait, what am I trying to say? We put a tall flag down yeah. that we are a relationship based organization mm. because it's the relationship of knowing the person yeah. that you can in context to who they are, who they're trying to become that you're able to provide some sort of feedback in that loop. So relationship-based organization first yeah. that is developmentally minded. Yes. So we're trying to get better, but we're grounded in the relationships. This is not therapy at work. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. not what this is. This is getting to know somebody yeah. so that you can support, then challenge them sure. to be their very best, even when it's hard. Yeah. So that's kind of the formula that sits underneath. When I hear you talk about the pirates, I'm like, that sounds familiar. So let's talk about being outcome based or process based because I think that's something I have thought a lot about. Like I feel like as I have done this longer, I care less and less about results. Eh, care is maybe the, the wrong word. I think less and less about results. Like with my first book, how does it do on the bestseller list? How many copies is it selling? And I'm checking all the time. There used to be this tool called Novel Rank, and you could see where your book ranked on every Amazon in every country in real time. And uh, thankfully it went away because it wasted so much of my time. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say today, I wouldn't even think of checking something like that. Like, I don't know, I, I don't know what the sales are on the books. And I, I, and I am yeah. always surprised you're, you're when like I find king. out. Like the, in, uh, feed them all cake. I know yeah. a queen said it, but yeah. like, you know, yeah. like, well, yeah. it's going to be a bestseller. Well, I just, I think about it less because <laughs> what I'm thinking about is what's more in my control, which is how it, yeah. is the, the work that I'm doing, yeah. right? And and you have a great graphic in here. Let me see if I did it. I loved it. Uh, you have this thing, which is basically the essence of stoicism. Uh, right, yeah. Uh, the essence of stoicism, Epictetus says, that our chief task in life is separating things into two categories, that which is in our control and that which is not in our control. And ultimately... Effort is in our control and outcomes are not in our control. Outcomes are related to things that we control and often a byproduct of it, but there is not a one-to-one -one relationship, especially as you get further and further out. So you could be maybe to a certain degree, winning is in your control, but people liking or respecting you or recognizing how magnificent your accomplishment was, definitely not, right? I, and I, I don't think winning is it anywhere in your control you can influence it yeah. you know in great ways but ultimately you've got a competitor that is trying to do the same thing so sure. there's there's yeah I, i'm not interested in the conversations about winning and losing and I, i'm not it, it's deleveraged mm. I, i'm now in a deleveraged position if i'm trying to control something that's not in my control yes and so to put yourself in the greatest position of leverage focus on the things and i would say go one step further than focus work on mastering the things yeah. that are 100 percent under your control sure and like I'd, I'd love to have a conversation with you about something that i think um stoicism is missed oh uh oh let's hear it yeah how dare you <laughs> <laughs> just that thing here, didn't it <laughs> is the way that we work with emotions okay and so there is an um there's an ordering 
in stoicism about thoughts, get your thoughts right. Sure. You know, work from that place. And I go, mm -hmm. yeah, thoughts are upstream. We know from best in class modern science that it is bi-directional. Thoughts influence emotions, emotions influence thoughts. Sure. And then in between, we've got feelings, which is our subjective interpretation of the raw data of emotions. Mm -hmm. So feelings are like private yeah. and they're internal and emotions are public and observable. Sure. So heart pounding is an emotion. Yeah. And then how you label it is your feeling. Okay. So I think we need more compassion. I think we need to work from emotion because we've numbed them for so long and we've been afraid of them for so long. And I do think at the time of stoicism, um, it made perfect sense not to be run over by emotions. Sure. And not, look, if you're gonna be over emotional, you can't do and make the hard decisions. I can't count on you because we've got hard decisions to make. Sure. I need to kill 100,000 people. To <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, or we, or I could, you could be killed at any moment. Your kid could die of some terrible disease at any moment. And if you panic yeah. and yeah. you're overrun by sure. emotion, then, then you can't make the clear decision. Because we do know sure. that emotions cloud judgment. judgment. Yeah. Okay. That's a brain structure type of thing. Okay. Now, but if you have a, if you can dance well, with emotion mm -hmm. and you can dance well with thoughts and you can play there just a little bit more. I think the world is calling for not an uncontrollable emotional human, mm -hmm. but a thoughtful, compassionate, dare I say, <laughs> person that is working to make something better. That's where purpose is so important. Yeah. Because purpose tends to be about something that's bigger than you. Sure. Right. And that tends to be about the planet or other people or yeah. animals or something. Right. Agreed. So, so I, I, I would love, so I'm, I'm caught in this and I'm, I've been looking forward to talking to you about this because I think you'll have a point of view here that I'm missing. Well, there's this stereotype of the Stoics being totally emotionless, being robotic, sort of stuffing it all down, uh, you know, suppressing it or being somehow getting to some monk-like transcendent state where you no longer feel emotions or anything at all, which I think totally misses it. So I did this book a few years ago called Lives of the Stoics, where instead of sort of really like diving into what the Stoics said, I just tried to write these biographies of who they were. Now the Stoics got married, the Stoics had kids, the Stoics made works of art, the Stoics played sports, the Stoics fought for political causes. There, there was this whole generation of Stoics called the Stoic Opposition, which was basically a series of resistance fighters who gave their lives in, in many cases against the tyranny of like these several bad emperors in a row, including Nero. So, and there's even one Stoic, there's a Stoic, there's a Stoic named Chrysippus who died of laughter. Like he was just laughing so hard he was old, he probably had a heart attack and died. So, so I think when we actually look at who they were in practice, it's very different than maybe what comes off in the page. Mm. And so, my my sort of take, and maybe this is a modern interpretation, which I'm also okay with. Like they're dead, they can't they can't get mad at me for changing things. Mm -hmm. But my interpretation is that the Stoics were not about the suppression of the emotion, but about understanding and processing, and then hopefully making fewer decisions on those emotions. So I like your distinction between having the emotion and the feel, like like being angry and punching someone because you're angry are different things, right? So to me, stoicism is the uh, stopping yourself before you throw the punch, as opposed to stopping yourself before you get upset that someone called you a terrible name. Yeah, and then the thing that I am I wrestle with, and I, just like I said yeah. early on, like stoicism is awesome. And yes. I've been attracted to it. And I wouldn't have thought this probably five years ago, that wait, we need more compassion. Agreed. So I and then if you square it with relationship based, okay. So that's where that at finding mastery, that's we're using that in our culture to be a relationship based organization as well. And to, to be in a relationship based organization, I need to know not only your thoughts. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. I need to know your history. Sure. I need to know the way you feel about your future and your history, and it's the feelings that allows for uh, the deeper knowing. And so I'm just, I just want to ring the bell a little bit here about compassion's a really good thing in a world that is thrashing. Of course. And there's a vulnerability to be compassionate. And 
So the cardinal Stoic virtues are courage, mm -hmm. which I think people associate with the Stoics. Then there's discipline, which people associate with the Stoics. Then there's wisdom, which people associate with the Stoics. But the fourth one, or which I guess it would be the third, is the one I'm writing about now, which I think is less discussed, sort of skipped over, is the virtue of justice, which is where I would put things like compassion and empathy and fairness and kindness and caring about the world and trying to have a positive impact. That's interesting, so, yeah. So it's like, it's not like it was this minor afterthought, like a, a core pillar, like one of the four pillars is this idea of justice. And to me, one of the ways I've thought about this is like, okay, stoicism in what I control says like, hey, try not to go around being offended all the time. Try not to be overwhelmed by your emotions, et cetera. But that doesn't change the fact that other people get offended and other people have emotions. And so I don't see there's anything contradictory about caring about that, right? So stoicism isn't, that is funny. There was this case a few years ago where <clears throat> this guy was just a real asshole at his job and he gets fired for being an asshole. And he says, act, he, he ends up suing, I think this is in the UK, he sues the employer for discriminating against him and his religion, which he said was stoicism. And sto his stoicism said that he didn't have to care about other people. He could dress how he wanted. He didn't have to He It was basically like he was saying stoicism allowed him to be a jerk, oh. which I think is totally missing the yeah, point, course, right? Yeah. I, don't, I don't think there's any contradiction uh, about empathy in stoicism. It's saying, hey, you should probably go around and you you yourself should probably not be an open wound that's horribly offended by other, what other people say all the time. But the, that doesn't mean that you get to hold other people to that standard and say, yeah, look, I just call it like I see it. Radical, tran radical candor here. I like, uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not polite, you know? So, so for me, I, I, I don't, I, we're, I think we're probably more in alignment here than people might think. And one of the things that actually gets me upset and I find myself pushing back on and again, to go to our point about not caring what the audience thinks. Like I know if I talk about courage, the audience, the stoic audience likes it. If I talk about self-discipline, the audience likes yeah, it. Right, if I talk right. about wisdom and how to learn and get smart, the audience likes it. But if I talk about justice, then people get upset, right? And I can see people unsubscribe. I see them get mad. If I... If I present stoicism as here's a recipe for being a better, more productive sociopath, that finds a larger audience and is less is less uh, uh, upsetting than if I go, hey, um, it's important that you give a shit about other people, <laughs> and it's important that you give a shit about the planet and mm -hmm. the ethics matter yeah, and morals. Right. Like, so I mm. I I talk about those things at significant expense to myself because mm. I think they're important. I think it's a really important part of stoicism. And I think it's it's why when you look at the lives of the stoics, you see that they they got involved in politics and they participated and they uh they served their country. They served like they, they were involved. There wasn't there we have this understanding of philosophy as something that withdraws you from the world, which is what the Epicureans did, right? right the Epicureans yeah. retreat to this garden and they they work on sort of perfecting their own development. And Stoicism, I think at its core says, that's not right. Somebody has to be involved because if you seed the field, somebody else takes over. And so um, uh, long story short, I, I do think there is a place for emotion, particularly compassion and Stoicism. And I think caring and participating is is not just like a part of it but like a key obligation of the philosophy what do you think the extension of stoicism is what does that so mean? um stoicism was built in a particular era sure and um they didn't have access to cognitive psychology yeah. they didn't neuroscience that they didn't have access to some of the science that we have now mm -hmm. They did. They did a pr pretty damn good job, you yeah. know, in a lot of things. And I just wonder what uh, the next version or the extension of. Um, and you might say, "No, they got it right," and I'm doubling down. I, I definitely don't say that because here, yeah. here's what's interesting about Stoicism. So Stoicism is founded by this guy named Zeno in the third century BC. So basically, the, the death of Alexander the Great, uh, Zeno washes up in Athens, and starts his philosophy. Now, Marcus Aurelius is writing meditations like around 160 AD. So here you have 500 plus years just between 
two well-known Stoics. And and I I don't say it, I wouldn't say it ends with Marcus Aurelius, but he's sort of the last well-known of the Stoics, right? Um, but but so there's five centuries there of evolution. It's not exactly the same. And in fact, one of the interesting things uh, that scholars sort of note is that there is this kind of, they, they call it a softening. I would say it's an improvement, but the sort of harsh individualistic stoicism of Zeno, uh, which is rooted in from his influences in the cynics, mm-hmm. um, softens by the time it gets to Marcus Aurelius because the Stoics take such a prominent role in public life. They serve as diplomats and generals and politicians and and, and, and then ultimately the culmination of the, sort of a philosopher king. But they get involved in life and you can't be involved in life and not see that things are complicated. You can't, you can't, you know, the, the Stoics would say the only thing that matters in life is virtue, right? Well, that's true, but like if you go around as this sort of self-righteous, holier-than-thou person, you're going to have trouble operating in a political world that requires compromise and collaboration for which there are no perfect solutions. So the, he says that there's this softening of Stoicism when they have to become more realistic and they have to participate in life. So all of which is to say, first off, even in Stoicism, when it was what you might call a living philosophy, there's an immense amount of changes and each individual Stoic puts their own stamp on it. Now, flash forward 2000 years later, do we are we obligated to stick with what Seneca talked about? I don't think so at all. Yeah, that, um, that, that, that's the question, right? Like what what is the neo stoicism what is the i don't the know I, I don't know if we even need to call it neo stoicism because then i think that stipulates that it it was never changing like so one of the things i love about seneca's writing seneca is by no means a perfect person uh, but seneca in his writings the philosopher he quotes the most is epicurus mm-hmm. who he ostensibly agrees with or disagrees with way more than he agrees with and he has he says uh, i read like a spy in the enemy's camp and he says, I'll quote a bad author if the line is good. Oh my God. And so yeah. uh, to me, what he's saying yeah, there, what yeah, we yeah. can take from that is that take and use anything that works from anyone, as long as it's consistent with the sort of core values of courage and discipline and justice and wisdom. So you think about like, it's not until effectively Gandhi in the middle of the 19th century that the idea of passive resistance or civil disobedience or uh, uh, like not solving your problems by killing people is invented, right? <laughs> so so like, and that's an incredible thing. And I think we skip over that, right? We like, th- people invented, a, like people invented things that have made uh, just, not just invented technological devices, but we invented things, like uh, ways of thinking about things that that's were right. profoundly Changing. That's very cool. Yeah, and, and so so with when the Sto- for the Stoics, the only way to solve a problem was to go to war. Two thousand years later, it's like, oh, hey, actually, you can protest. Uh, you, you know, you you can list your grievances. You can resist. There's all these other things you can do. So I think we would be doing the Stoics a disservice if we did not incorporate those things into it. Again, provided that it is. Uh, consistent with the core virtues, which I think are pretty expansive. Yeah, I do as well. And I'm reminded of a, this was an early, go back to early days of college for me one more time, is that um, it was the first, uh, it was the pass at like 11 world religions. And so we're studying all 11. Yeah. Sikhism to Zoroastrianism to Judaism. And so we're studying all 11. And I had this wonderful idea that I was going to stand up and say, you know, if we combined, this is my humble opinion, if we combine this, 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 there's a commonality here, here, here. And if we cobbled together a couple of these, like these common ideas, like, <laughs> and so the professor says, thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding your point of view here is that you believe that um, you've discerned deeper than Buddha, Confucius, <laughs> Jesus, and Muhammad. I just want to make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, sure. Right. In, in, in your, you know, six days of class here. <laughs> So, you know, it is so easy to opine from a distance, of course, as opposed to develop from within. And this is where I think we come back to that signal to noise ratio yeah. is for for us to understand what the signal is. Yeah. And if the stoic approach can help. Awesome. Yeah. And if it's resting on a, a bed of virtues, 
that are um, generative rather than uh, self-serving. Yeah, and so that that to me is a is a one of the the bedrock of the whole thing. Yeah, and and not all the innovations are these massive breakthroughs in like science or psychology or neuroscience. Although there's many of those that we have to incorporate. But like I, I'm I'm fond of that idea in in uh, recovery groups of you know the acronym HALT like hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Oh, yeah. that, that you have to think yeah, about if you're right. any of those things before you make a decision. Yeah. So so nowhere does Marx Realis or Seneca or Epictetus is they're talking about being rational and not being driven by your emotion. Nowhere do they go like, have you eaten today? But like that's a huge part of right. uh, of of being better at these things. That's right. Right. And so so I the idea that we're just supposed to stick with what they came up with two thousand years ago is naive. But also that that fits pretty seamlessly into the you know if they're saying like hey you know don't trust your first impressions right um, well that's not just hey what do I think about this but also we now understand that what we think about it is formed by what's going on inside of our body that's right, right? that's the embodied cognition piece right? and, and yeah. so I think we have even to incorporate our, all that even stuff. by our gut biome yeah of course yeah right which they didn't have access to the science but they had great insight and intuition mm -hmm. about how things are working. It also are, makes you way more empathetic of other people if you understand this, right? Like, so you have kids and you go, my kid's not an asshole, they just skipped their nap, right? My, my kid's not a monster, their routine was disrupted. And, and so you get really good at separating between the behavior and the person. Hopefully you can give that gift to yourself, but hopefully, definitely you can learn to give that gift to humanity, which is the person who cut you off in traffic just got a call on headphones that their mother died or whatever, right? You can go, oh, you can you can realize that things are always happening to people. And if we can be kind and empathetic and separate between the person and the behavior, it allows us to be more empathetic and then also not be so frustrated, mm -hmm. right? Um, not, not like, ironically, Socrates said that, you know, nobody does wrong on purpose. And then we have this understanding of, oh, okay, why are people doing things that are wrong? And then we can, it helps us manage our emotions, but then it also helps us understand and appreciate what other people are going through. Is one of the things that um, my wife and I, we've been married a long time, like yeah. we're great friends. And um, I come from a, an approach that I don't know anyone that's a villain in their own story. Yes. Right. And yeah. so, so we're looking for reasons why we are mm -hmm. slighted or agitated or tired sure. or fatigued. And so um, that helps me give a pass to people yeah. to look at, the behavior in a different way and not assault the person. Yeah. Um, and she says, you're making up stories. That's bad behavior. Sure. That that is unacceptable. Yeah. Right. Like, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Yeah. What the deal is. That's not right. And so like there's a that's our one of our tensions. And sure. one of her one of her virtues that she is um, uh, thinks is not a healthy virtue is fairness. The fairness is not a healthy virtue to rest on. And I'm oh. like, yeah. And so, and we've had a lot of what talk. What does that about, mean? So walk me through that. So fairness, um, that she feels it's a dangerous um, duping, that we should be in a world of, that to we should build To insist that our, things are fair? No, to build children, children's philosophy that let's work out of fairness. Okay. As opposed to, uh, and the reason being is because there's wolves in the world. Yeah, sure. And there's slippery folks that like are trying to take advantage. Sure. I happen to believe the world is dangerous and hostile. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's set up for my success or your success sure. or happiness for all. Like it's a pretty toxically dangerous world. Yeah. Okay. So put a pin in that. So then we we raise these young babes saying, act out of fairness. Sure. But you're you're you might be working in tandem with a wolf in sheep's clothing, and so or a selfish person that's trying to get theirs rather than support yours. So it's an interesting philosophical so, position about the concept of fairness. Yeah, uh, it, it is tricky because so you have this virtue of justice uh, and we control whether we behave with justice, but we don't really control whether other people act fairly or rightly. But should we let the fact that other people act that way make us not act that way? I think that's the tricky part. I think that that's where society is holding together loosely yeah. is that many people hold the position of my wife which is like well if that's going to happen i'm 
I need to protect myself. Yeah. Okay. Right. If there's a bunch of wolves out there, I can't just kind of walk out there and say, hey guys, let's share the meat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's sure. share the cockers. Can I get some? Yeah. You know, as opposed to uh, other virtues of maybe kindness, mm -hmm. but not fairness is an mm. interesting split between the two. So I, I take your point, which is, um, no, my actions need to be um, my own, yeah. not in only reaction to somebody else's actions. So, yeah. yeah so I, I, th I think that is a tension, even in the Stoic text, is that you have this moral compass, you have this standard you hold yourself to, and then you have to deal with the fact that the vast majority of people in the world, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously, do not operate the same way. And there's this great line in meditations where Marcus goes, remember you do not live in Plato's Republic. And and, yeah, and he's, he's yeah. he he didn't set up the system. He didn't choose to be in the system. Right. He has to operate inside the system. And and I think there is uh there is this idea, for instance, I forget what maybe it's Kennedy who said it. He said, like, you know, parents want their kids to be president, but they don't want them to be politicians. Mm. And in fact, we need more politicians. Mm. Like po political success or or operating in a political domain is a skill that requires mastery just like any other skill. And oftentimes what happens is you either have complete monsters who have that skill or you have uh, great human beings who enter that world without any of the skill and they they think they're living in Plato's Republic where, you know, the 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 just cause always wins and if i can just give the right speech you know everyone will give me a standing ovation and then you know vote to fund right, ukraine yeah, or whatever right, but that's yeah. not fucking how it works yeah. um and 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 the system we have is set up to mitigate some of those toxic impulses but they nevertheless exist and you have to figure out how to be savvy inside them and i've always found this like i'll recommend robert green's works and people go oh it's so awful i'm like if you think that you're the person who needs to read it yeah, more than right. anyone yeah. because you mm. are saying that because you don't like something or you don't want it to be true, that it's not true. And that's not how it There's is. There's a reaction to the laws of power. Yeah. Is that the one? Yeah. So are you, are you, um, do you have your eye on campaign 2032 or something? Like, are you like, <laughs> I definitely not. I have zero interest in, uh, in participating in, in politics in that sense. But, um, are you, are, do you, do you, think of yourself as a philosopher or as a commentary on philosophy? I don't know. I, I mean, I think there's, in the world we live in, I feel like there's something a little delusional, grandiose about calling yourself a philosopher. Mm. So I prefer to see, my, I, I think it's healthier to see myself as a, number one, as a person who's trying to use philosophy in my life. And then number two, as a writer who happens to write about philosophical ideas. And then if somebody else wants to put those two things together and call me a philosopher, I'm not going to argue with you, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not important. And in fact, maybe, uh, dangerous for that to be incorporated into my self identity. So I'm glad we bring it up because we, we go after in the book, a performance based identity. Yeah. And that is one of the great on ramps to a radical fear of people's opinions yeah right is so and it makes perfect sense to me that in certainly the west we are obsessed with performance yes like at age at eight we're given grades mm -hmm. you know, or you know like so we we have we like performance now so it makes perfect yeah. sense that people would mingle their identity with performance and so it's, sure. it's a thing called a performance-based identity and a performance-based identity basically is i am what i do relative to how well you do it yeah so it's not just i am what i do which a healthier version is i am who i am yeah okay but it's i am what i do relative to how well i do it next to you yeah and that's sure. where it gets really really tricky yeah because now i need to be better than you yeah and m maybe i'm a friend or maybe i'm a competitor or whatever My competitors can be friends as well so this this idea of having a performance-based identity the work is to decouple who I am from what I do. Yes. And that takes a very long time. I heard it in what you just said. Well, my friend Austin Cleon, who's amazing, he's done a bunch of great books, but he says, the problem is too many people want to be the noun rather than do the verb, mm. right? So like, I like writer versus author even, because like, what I do is write things, right? And, 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 uh, and I do it every day. And the fact that these, those things are at some point packaged together 
called a book and then flung to the public to sell or not sell, you're getting for each step of that, it's getting further away from what I control. And fundamentally, I think more importantly, getting further away from what I do. Right. right. And so I think so often, like, are you, are, do you see yourself as a, as a point guard or do you see yourself as an, an all-star, right. Or an NBA star or a team captain, like you start to get towards roles as opposed to like jobs or status. I think both of and, those are equally dangerous. Yes. You know, which is underneath is, so I, I two funny stories. Uh, one, well, I'll leave the humor decision up to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Actually, That's not in your control. Yeah. Right. That's right. I'll, I'll yeah. be the judge. Yes. Yeah. The, the first one actually is not funny at all, but the second one is, um, I, I walked into a, a, a fitness uh, gym yeah, and it was one of those kind of structured classes, gyms. And the, uh, the person behind the desk comes up and goes, oh, are, 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 are you Mike Gervais? Like, and I go, oh, thank you. Yeah. And, and he says, um, man, I don't want to bug you. I know you're going into doing this thing. And, um, but I'd love to talk to you about like, you know, at some point I said, okay, no problem. So I come in a, a week later, I'm, I'm back in there and he says, you know, could you just really quickly, could you tell me um, how you've become, you know, like what you, I'd love to do yeah. what you do at some yeah. point. And I said, oh, no problem. It's like, you know, undergraduate, yeah. a graduate degree in this, PhD in psychology, then you got to get licensed. And then you, you really don't know anything. So yeah. you need some real kind of time under tension. And I could see kind of this glazed over look. I said, it's about 16 to 20 yeah. years before you're kind of in, yeah. in the space, right? And of course I'm pointing to the, my applied art science yeah. of psychology. And he says, wait, to be a podcaster? <laughs> See what I what I thought, which has happened to me before, is, and this is why audience and fame can be dangerous, right? Is you get like you get used to people recognizing mm -hmm. you, or coming up to you and talking to you, even if it even if it's not like at some huge level, like the way that, like a, a you know a world famous person would be. But you get used to occasionally people recognize you. And I remember I was at the airport a couple months ago, and this person um, sort of comes up to me, and I could see they're. Anyways, they come up to me and and. Uh, they they start talking to me out of my headphones and i thought they were coming up to me as a fan right and mm -hmm. so you go into like the this is this when you've identified yourself as a person who gets recognized right yeah i'm going into that interaction right and really they just wanted me to move like i was in the way of something <laughs> you know what i mean and, and so so, so you you get you, you it it they say fame is a mask that eats at the face it you're i the thing you do so it become you become conscious of your status or role in the world and then it changes literally how you interpret reality. If I was a regular person, uh, and I am a regular person, but if if I didn't have the experiences that I had, mm -hmm. my first, my mind would never have even conceived that this person was recognizing me or that I was important. There's a status differential or whatever. I, my my initial impulse would be, am I in somebody's way, you know? And so, so like when you identify with something or things become normalized to you, it, it fundamentally sh shapes your, your understanding of reality and usually 100%. not in a good way. hundred percent. That's so good. <laughs> that's so funny. Oh, cool, man. But that's, I think that in your case, I would, I would say you, you passed the test in the sense that you went towards the harder thing that you do and the, the training and the work that went into, work it, into it, as opposed to, you know, the easy, because a lot of the, the problem is, and I think Austin's right, people want to do, be the noun, not do the verb. And, and, and people want to be, people want to be famous mm -hmm. as opposed to do things for which the byproduct is some level of fame. Like uh, I'm wearing an Iron Maiden shirt, but my, one of my favorite quotes from the lead singer of Iron Maiden is he said, um, he said, fame is the excrement of creativity. Oh, he's like it's so the fun. it's the sludgy thing that comes out or is it is it's the it's the the thing that comes out the backside uh and his, his point is that um if you do stuff that l large amounts of people like or you do things long enough that you as accumulate an uh, an audience of people who have seen you do what you do then the byproduct of that is fame the you can be a famous astronaut you could be a famous chemist you can be famous for many things or so, so you could say, "Hey, I need to go do something, and I and, and I'm going to focus on that process, and hopefully or potentially the byproduct of it is that a large amount of people know who I am, which is not as great as people think it is, but it it does happen. 
Or you could be someone that says, I want a large amount of people to know who I am. And then that's where you get reality TV stars or Donald Trump or whatever, right? Yeah. Like not not great so outcomes. Yeah, but like I, I live in LA yeah. and it spits people right out. Of course. Like it's just such a heavy place because they're attracted. So many are attracted to the lights. Yeah. And if you don't have some roots, you know, like you get spun quickly. Or if you don't have a craft that you can fall back on, because again, there's so many things that are outside your control. How how quick you get traction, how your things do. There's so much between you and and those things that you are nice to have. Mm. Um, like the Stoics have this great concept they call there's there's um, there's things that are up to us and there's things that are not up to us. But they say there's kind of this middle category of what they call preferred indifference, not indifference e n c e, but indifference like e n t s, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that there are th like if you work really hard on a book, it's the best thing you've ever done and you're so proud of it. And um, if if I asked you, do you want it to sell a million copies or zero copies, right? Well, the Stoics would say it's not fully in your control, so you should be indifferent. But you obviously have a preference, right? <laughs> yeah, like, right. It, would, you, would you prefer to be born really tall or really short? You have a preference, right? Mm -hmm. Would you rather be poor or rich? Mm -hmm. You have a preference, right? Now, the Stoic would say you should be able to work with either, mm -hmm. right? And and it neither says anything about you as a person, but preference, mm -hmm. right? And so as long as that preference doesn't fundamentally change who you are or make you vulnerable to being unhappy if you don't get that thing, it's, I think, okay to have a preference. Yeah. Pre preferences are cool. Yeah. And I think if, if you see it as a preference, then it's great. Mm -hmm. But the problem is if you see it as a necessity or you see it as a just reward. Like that was my other thing when I was thinking about uh, fear of what other people think or, or um, is uh, is Mark Strauss has this line in meditations where he says, he says, stop asking for the third thing. So he says, you've done something good and someone has benefited from it. He says, stop asking for the third thing. And he says, the third thing is gratitude, recognition, appreciation, compensation, whatever. Like the different cool. situations yeah. demand different, uh, w w provoke from us a desire for a different third thing. But I like the idea of like, do the thing, hope it, like, you know, do the thing so it lands. Up to you, it's it's uh, in your control. And then not needing that third thing. That's a pure place to come from. It's a little bit like um, the Zen insight about the two arrows, the second arrow. So the first Tell arrow, me that story. the first arrow that's shot is something that happens. Like it's something outside of you. It happens, yeah. and maybe you um, you're crossing, you know, your nice little street here, and somebody hits you. Yeah. Right. So that's the first arrow. It's an arrow you get hit with, not an arrow you're shooting. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And the second arrow is the one you shoot. Right. And it's your it is your um, critical or judgmental or hostile or whatever interpretation. That, yes. that, so the second arrow is the one you shoot. The first arrow mm. is the one that happens to you, and the second arrow is the one you shoot. So the second arrow is suffering. Yes. The first arrow might be pain. Yeah. Right. And then the second arrow is suffering. So be be careful of the second arrow. Yeah. Is the thought. And if you square those two insights with, um, with the Stoics, it's like you're in control how you shoot the second arrow, whether you shoot it or not. Sure. And so it's a, I think it's a pretty cool it, way of thinking about it. Actually, the the Stoic sort of explanation of that I. I, I knew it, but it was funny. I saw it when I when I spoke at the Pirates. They had this on the wall. It was, you know, you go into the NFL. The second era, not the second era. No, this, this stoic line. Okay. You know, you go into like locker rooms, and sometimes like it's fun. all cliches come from something at some point, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of these unattributed quotes actually there is an attribution at some point. So they had it on the wall as just like a line, a, a commandment inside their organization. They didn't know who said it, but it actually comes from Epictetus. He says it's not things that upset us. It's our judgment of things. So the, of course, the first arrow does hurt. But if you tell yourself, it's a metaphorical arrow, right? So right. It's, it's the telling yourself you've been screwed over, that you've been singled out, that your life is over. You know, all, it's, it's the, the story you tell yourself about that thing. That's what the second arrow is. That's right. And I think one of the deepest, most rewarding states, uh, continued states that you can get into is a a love affair with the unfolding present moment, a love mm. affair with experience. And I learned that from a mentor friend, John Kabat-Zinn, the idea that- there, uh, Wherever you go, there you are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
like he's such a rich, of course. Um, amazing human. But the idea is, do you have a love affair with the present moment, mm. with experience itself? And if you could fall in love with the unfolding, unpredictable, unknown moment, yeah. as opposed to be anxious, protection, try to control stuff, just be in love yeah. with showing up sure. and experiencing this moment. It's an amazingly powerful way to go through life. You end up being in life yeah. rather than trying to calculate how to achieve or you know work for, from an ambitious standpoint. And so, and that does not mean that you're just going to kind of uh, be a tumbling weed or just kind of go wherever the wind flows because you've got some bellwethers, you've got your virtues, you've got your purpose, but do you have a love affair or are you afraid of the unknown present moment? Oh, and wait, wait, let me finish this thought. I, I'm, I'm rolling. <laughs> is that I think this is why I love, it became about, apparent about halfway through working with the, the Seahawks is that it became so clear that the way they fundamentally organize their life is to go embrace the unknown mm. and to do it publicly, that we see that. They don't know. We don't know how the outcome's going to go, and they bring all of themselves into it. The, the ones that are like, I think, noble in the approach. And then, one more layer to that is that that's what they do on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, and they don't do it publicly, hmm. but they do it in front of their peers. Yeah, they get to the messy edge, where they could fall into a thousand pieces, and they do it in front of people that decide whether they get to play on Sunday or not. Yeah, so people with real power and control and your peers that are, by the way, trying to take your job. Some yeah, of them. Yeah, There's yeah. a depth chart. Sure. Like everyone's mm -hmm. trying to get the starting job. So I have such regard for the fundamental decisions they've made and the fundamental commitment to go to the unknown, the messy edge at the unknown. That, that to me is way more important than celebrating or thinking that they're born different. Celebrating the achievements, you know, when they're on the podium or whatever, and then thinking that they're born different they practice fundamentally to be their very best in relatively dangerous environments emotionally because like you got to get to the edge where you don't know if you're good or not and there's people watching saying not good enough yeah publicly well, as you were as you brought that up what it spurred in me was this idea of like okay do you love football or basketball or surfing or golf or writing or you know trading stocks do you love that or do you love winning Right? Do you love uh, being uh, seen as great at those things? Um, and the person who loves all of it, like I, I just, I love the squeaking of the shoes on the floor and I love getting in the pool at 5 a.m. If you love the thing, you're going to do it longer and better and be able to ride the ups and downs of it than the person who, you know, it turns out they've only liked it because it's been going their way a long time. That's right. And yeah. and I remember uh, Shaka Smart was talking about this, who we both know. He was at Texas, now he's at Marquette. He was saying that like kids will quit and they'll say they, you know, they just don't feel the same way about the game anymore. And he's like, is that really true? Or was what you thought was your feeling about the game the fact that you were always the best you were, and it always went you were your six, way? Six four in, in as a sophomore in high school and it was easy yes. and you got lots of attention. Yes, this is the poison of external yes. recognition, you know. And so, if you if you deconstruct motivation in on four variables, you could think about internal and external. Mm -hmm. And so the external there's external rewards and external drivers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then. So the way we think about it is two words, uh, extrinsic and external. Yeah. So, and then you go inside and you go intrinsic, external, or internal. internal. And so the intrinsic is like, do you have, do you love the unlock? Yeah. Do you love the way it feels to figure something out? And then internally driven is like, so that's the reward. The internal drive is like, you don't have to wake me up. You don't have to yeah. like tap my shoulder to you know, get ready to mm -hmm. go to, like, I'm driven. Yeah. But the rewards are the unlock, the love affair with sure. figuring things out. Mm -hmm. And if I really love that, I got to keep going to the edge. Yeah. I got to keep getting to the frontier because that's when it, that's where it happens most often. Sure. But the, those are, those are harder to come by because the world outside of us is giving us lots of externals. Yeah. Hey, you need to do this. You need to do that. 
uh, oh my God, you're so amazing. Sure. This is like, are you ready for, you know, next week's game against the crosstown rival? You know, all of that external noise definitely clouds the internal signal. Yeah, right. But so, so the tricky part of that is, so if you have that intrinsic unlock that gets you motivated and then internally motivated, yeah. that's what allows you to, to keep doing it, to do it for a that's long it. time. But then do you find that can also be hard to turn off? Oh yeah. Like I, how to and, stop. Well, yeah, it's, it, there's a, um, a near obsession when you really love the unlocking because yeah. It's such an electric embodied experience yeah. when those ahas happen. Actually, we can see the signature. It's gamma brain waves take place, which is, you know, similar to a flow state experience, but it's the insight. <gasps> yeah. And I think the the philosophers were like, they would spend time discerning, thinking deep, going deeper, deeper to try to get to the essence of something. <gasps> I got it. So that's a gamma brain wave experience. That's an aha moment. We yeah. call it insight. And we call it in the performance world an unlock. Yeah. Insight, unlock, aha. Th that stuff is so embodied and rich yeah. that there's an addiction to that. Um, I only wanted to, I didn't care about working with pro athletes. I only wanted to work with people that were as obsessed as I was at trying to figure out how to get better. I was just thinking there's, there's basically been like one boxer ever who retired like at oh, the right yeah, time. You know right. what I mean? Like, so you get this, that it's, on the one hand, being extrinsically and externally motivated, it, it's great as long as everything goes your way, which is unlikely, but you know it works. Uh, it can work. But so, so it's better to be that sort of intrinsically motivated thing, and it's better than being at the mercy of everything going your way. I think you need both high. I don't think. I think it's um, before you go to the boxer. I don't think that this Pollyannish approach um, is that the right word? Pollyannish, mm -hmm. Pollyannish idea that intrinsic needs to be the number one. As long as it's high, sure. you can have equally yeah. high external, you know, drivers and rewards. Like that's sure. cool. Like if you are the best in the world and and people like the thing that you're doing and they want to give you money, that's okay. I, me I remember when when my books first started to come out in sports, you called me and you gave me a bunch of advice and you were like, one thing, you were like, don't ever talk to a sports team for free. And I was like, <laughs> why? And it was, I was like, and you were like. They're huge multi-million dollar, sometimes billion dollar organizations, and they all pretend like they don't have money, but they do. They do. And you should, if you provide value, you should be paid for it. And I, I like, cause there's some part of you, if you are intrinsically or internally motivated, you're like, I'm just happy to be here. I'm just happy this to do awesome. what I do. There's an unlock here. Yeah, like, yeah. We're gonna and that's all great, but you should also, you should, you're not doing yourself. One of the things I've learned, you're not doing yourself any favors by not getting paid the most amount you can get paid That's right. for that thing. And I want to go back to yeah. boxers, right? Yeah. And um, they're not put, if you don't value it yeah. in that way, they're not going to really value it. So I've it's always a nice- Anytime I've done less than my fee or not for it, I always regret it in that it just turns out to be a disaster. Like yeah, that's right. it's, it takes a lot, it's, it's just, there's something clean about, I show up, you pay me this. It, like businesses, we developed this these practices for a reason. That's right. Yeah. It's nice and clean yeah. that way. Yeah. And so, yeah, man, I'm, that's cool. <laughs> I think about it all the time. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I, and I think that for um, for all of us, like I, the way I make decisions, there's three vectors. Yeah. One is, um, is there an economic uh, reward? Yeah. Um, does it move the needle towards goodness? Yeah. Okay. So there's there something compelling or purposeful that that is is taking place, and is it going to be fun? Yeah. Is it cool? So I need two of those three, and I just need to know if I get all three, it's awesome. Yeah. But I definitely need two of those three. Yeah. I I don't like just showing up and taking money. Of course. If if it's show up take money and it's fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. And then, but I definitely need the, the third one, yeah. you know, in there as well. So if you can get all three of those together, I'm like, that's, a, this is a home run. Are you kidding me? But, but I, I guess what I'm saying is intrinsic, extrinsic. The, the point is some people have the problem. They don't have enough motivation. Then other people, you're just, you just do it longer than you should. You can't, you can't stop doing it because this you're, is the you're back to the boxer here. You're back yeah. to the identifying with being a thing, getting to do a thing as opposed to what's best for you, what's most sustainable, et cetera. Well, so the professional sport world yeah. is really electric. And if you have identified yourself with being a performer, whatever the performance is, um, 
one, it's really fun. It's electric. Your identity is merged with it. Yeah. It's a near death sentence. Yeah. This is why 87% are divorced, broke, a mess yeah. within two years of retiring. Yeah. It's because their identity is so merged with what they do. Sure. So most have to get kicked out. I think you'd yeah. have to kick me out too. Yeah. Right. And sure. because it's fun, it's amazing. But you left. I did leave. So they didn't, you didn't have to kick you out. No, I, I left because um, there was a pandemic and I had to move my family up to Seattle to be in the bubble. Right. And so logistically it sure. stopped, but it was just, it was a perfect So time that was great though. I mean, the pandemic was a forcing function for me in a lot of ways. It just, it, you get so comfortable doing what you've done and just going along with how things go. Sometimes you need something to come in yep. and force you to get back to your first principles or, or reevaluate some assumptions and you go, oh, wait, this isn't the way it should go or I wanted it to go all That's the right. time. And what do I want my life to look like? For me, it was like perfect timing. It wasn't easy, but Coach Carol and I, the head coach of the Seahawks, we had built a business taking best practices in sport, how to train your mind to be your very best. Mm -hmm. And we crosswalked those into enterprise companies and large corporations. So when the pandemic hit, it, it was like, I think it's time to go run that thing full yeah, time. What do sure. you think, Pete? And he, coach, and he says, yeah, like this sure. is eloquent. And mm -hmm. so that's where I've been the last um, handful of years doing that. But it's it's hard, it's hard to stop. And I think your point is, yeah, a lot of times you have to, something either has to force you out or you have to literally be forced out. The pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. And imagine like if I, uh, I talk about with my wife all the time, again, best friend, great partner. And she's like, we, we go up. We go up. Like if that's what you yeah. want to do, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of uproot. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad I didn't. Yeah. Right. Like I'm, it's, it's when you can have the um, internal practice to get down to the truth of things so that you can discern and you can feel your way in there. See what I did? Yeah. <laughs> Not just think, but you can think and feel your way yeah. in there. It's, it just, uh, I think it gets exponentially easier. All right. So I want to talk about finding mastery for a second. Then I'm going to come back to Beethoven, who you talk a lot about in the book. But when you say finding mastery, do you think it's an external thing or is it an internal thing? So there's mastery of self and mastery of craft. Yeah. I'm far more interested in the internal experience. The the commitment to the path to get to the truth of whatever what you value, right? So whatever you're attending to. And so it's a the path of mastery is really what it's about. And so what we're it's like the approach towards trying to better understand it is what finding means in that sense. Mm. And so mastery is mastery of craft and mastery of self. I've sat and asked the question to so many people, you included, um, like, what do you think about mastery? And yeah. most people say, there's like two that didn't say this. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like, I'm, I love it. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'm on the path. I think I am, mm. you know, like this idea that it's an unfolding as opposed to there was two people like, yeah, I have mastered my craft. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like most yeah. people are like, it's this thing. Yes. It's a path. It's a process. It's a, it's a becoming, it's an understanding, it's an unlocking and I'm committed to it. Yeah. And I'm more interested in mastery of self through craft. Sure. Mastery of craft alone feels hollow. Well, because there's a lot of people who are very good at what they do, but also monsters. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly, yeah. that's well said. Yeah. yeah. So mastery of self through craft. So the craft is the um, the tool or the utility as opposed to the reversing it, mastery of craft and mastery of self. Yeah, um, don't you think there's kind of a point, so you, you get really good at something, maybe you get really successful at that thing. It usually happens, but not always. So you get really good at something and then you kind of have this crossroads moment where you go, is this going to be my whole thing? Am I, is it going to be everything about me and I'm going to sacrifice everything to maintain it or keep going with it? Or now I have this kind of second challenge, which is how do I integrate this mastery and this success into a seemingly normal, healthy, well-adjusted life, relationships, people, happiness? That's right. Yeah, that, uh, you're hitting the nail in the head. That's why it's self through craft. Yeah. So the craft can actually change. Yeah. So, you know, you think about um, Anders Ericsson's work on number of hours. You know, it's not 10,000. It's more like 16 to 20,000. Yeah. And which is 
fun to be that. that Did they just move thing. the goalposts on you? <laughs> yeah, right, you're getting it. right now. Oops. Oops. Got to yeah. do it twice now. <laughs> so, so this this idea that you you put in some real work towards something and you have the sense of being artistic yeah. with the expression of that craft, you don't need to do another. 40 years or 20 years, like happy to pivot. That's cool. And there can be, I was sitting with the, um, he was one of, he was the CEO of Pay- PayPal. He's now the CEO of Nike. And John says, um, he was right in the middle of what he was going to do next. And he was a uber successful CEO. Yeah. And he says, um, I feel like I kind of have golden handcuffs on hmm. where the world is expecting me to go back and do that thing. Cause I'm so good at it and I could do it really well wherever I go next but I might want to just take pictures. I might want to hmm. move into photography. I don't know, yeah. which is, it's not using any of the tactical, technical skills of CEO ship. But if he could rest on um, the skills he's worked that are um, agnostic to the craft, but consistent with self, then you can apply those somewhere hmm. else. And of course we get to crosswalk some of the skills like athletes get to they know how to be coached. They know how to work hard. They know how to be on time. They know how to be good teammates. You could crosswalk those into lots of organizational or or other well, places as well. I just mean like, okay, so obviously there's a very few percent, uh, small percentage of people who have ever played basketball, soccer, football, whatever, that they get to do at the professional level. But then you're saying that 87% of those people, like that, you know, the, the, one per, the 0.001%, but 87% of them end up divorced, broke, unhappy, all that stuff, Within right? Within two years of yeah. retirement. So, so I'm saying you kind of, you kind of face this second ch- challenge That's right. of like going, I'm going to be great at this thing and not let it destroy me, yep. or I'm going to be great at this and I'm, I'm going to be happy. Oh, I'm going to be it's happily a, married. It's a dangerous proposition. It's very hard to navigate. I had a gentleman who was in, about four months retired and he came home from, um, not being recognized at the supermarket. Okay. So normally when, you know, he goes to a local supermarket and everyone's like, "Ah," you know, and so he's like, I came home and it was so jarring to me that I turned and said to my wife, you know, I don't know how you're going to give me the love of a hundred thousand screaming fans. (laughs) And he said to me, I knew my life was in shambles. Like relationship was over. It probably never really was Yeah, because it was more about me. Something else was, was subsidizing it. That's a good word. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's kind of, that's how slippery this thing at some point flashes in their face. Like, oh God, I don't know who I am. And they don't know who I am anymore. Who am I? I went through the, that this year. Like I, I, the book I was working on was basically done in January. And instead of going into production, I pushed it a year mm-hmm. just to have some more space to do more family stuff, just to kind of rest a little bit. And I, and part, part when I pushed it, I was thinking, I'm tired. I don't want to, because I'm doing this four book series. I was like, I don't think I'm ready to just finish this and start the next one. Yeah. And so I was thinking about it like, hey, this is going to be really uh, restful and regenerative. And it's going to be easier to take time off than to, to just start, you know, training for the next season, so to speak. And I would say that this year has actually been much harder. It would have been much easier to just stay run, run, at your fighting weight run, and run, run the play. Yeah, run, and then yeah. then to 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 yep. stop and try to exist more as a functioning person in a world and a relationship and family. Like, because like it didn't just hey, I was working eight hours a day on this book and now I'm not. I I was like. It was, well, if you're not doing that, you need to pick the kids up from school. Just way more right. stuff in life, which yep. I have no problem doing. I've loved doing it. But it it challenges you. It's easier to be like a finely tuned machine that sloughs off all the responsibilities of being a, a functioning, happy person. And, and also you're just so busy, you don't have to think about, am I happy? Is this how it should go? How do I want things to be? Why was work such a large part of my life, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. And, and so weirdly the year is harder than doing it the hard way. Probably an outsized impact for the health of your life later, yes. you know, like mm-hmm. outsized, like yes. a real one and, and yes, harder. Yeah. Cause you know how to run the play Yeah. of grinding to publish and to get out and do, you know that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's cool. That's a, that's a, that's a cool moment for you to reflect on too. Well, and then now I about in January, I have to start 
the book that I paused for a year. And so now you can, gotta gear, get, can get I, back into shape. Well, can I, but can I get back yeah. in shape, but also not, not just swing from one pole to the other, mm -hmm. right? Like, can I now get in shape and do the thing? And I'm not out of shape because I, I just spent more time kind of slowly working on the other book. It's just different. It's different shape. Right. Mm -hmm. But like, can I, can I go, can I be, do a healthier version of a season, you know, in the way that, you know, the first five seasons of someone's career are going to be very unbalanced and totally weighted in one direction. And you would hope a veteran athlete that has a family and commitments and other responsibilities is just more balanced. And, and you also, you learn stuff about yourself and you learn stuff about the game and hopefully you get more efficient at it also. Yeah. You can see f you have different frames of reference. Yes. You can spot things a little s sooner. You're working upstream rather than the rapids. And, you know, I, I also think that what you're pointing to is under celebrated, which is the power of a partner. Mm -hmm. And so um, having a great partner is really important. Yeah. And I, I did not, it took me too long to recognize that I was early in my career. I was really trying to understand the golden thread of like, what did the, what are the commonalities amongst the greats? Sure. And I found some kind of interesting, you know, red threads in there, golden threads, but I, I totally missed looking at my own life and and many of them it's like they've got great structure and partnerships and they've got people in their corner that believe in them and bet and bet on them whether they are in return honoring as well is a different story yes but there's a there's a support mechanism um, that allows their head to hit the pillow in a, in a good way a supportive way yeah i think one of the things you find like people are concerned that being married, having a spouse, whatever, is going to take away or tie them down. And I, I sort of go, it does. It ties you down to reality. <laughs> like it's <laughs> it, you're 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 held down on earth as opposed to floating off into the space of celebrity or greatness or what it's it's it it's keeping you balanced and healthy in a really I don't know way. if I could have gone to the agitated edges that I did in my early career if I would have had two kids. So sure. we, we started late with kids. So I have great respect for people that have figured out how to do that. Yeah. And I see it in coaching all the time is they're at the facility 14 hours a day Yeah. and they're coaching these, let's call it 22 year olds, but they don't know their 17 year olds at yeah. home. Yeah. They're 14 and you know, they're 21 year old. They don't know them Yeah. because they're spending 14 hours sure. a day with, you know, so I don't know how I would have done it. And I think I would have, unfortunately, sacrifice that relationship for my own agitated edge pursuing yeah you, just, you learn by trial and error and it, it, it can't survive the trial. yeah i'm so i'm really glad that yeah. I, I i didn't have that forcing function because i think i would have taken the selfish path yeah and that would have stung me because that's it's kind of how i was raised yeah so i didn't have a great relationship with my folks yeah and i love them and you know but their stuff was more important than my stuff and it, their stuff was alcohol and, you know, and like codependency. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, um, and so, and I, again, I love my parents, but I think I would have made that same mistake. Yeah. Mine wouldn't have been alcohol and drugs and codependency and a, a narrative outside of the truth. It would have been, oh, dad's grinding, dad's yeah. doing his thing, da, da, da. And it, I just would have missed, mm. you know, kind of changing the generational parenting model. I remember when I visited you at the Seahawks, I asked Coach Carroll about this because he's been married a, a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, you guys work these insane hours and you travel. And, and, and he, I was like, well, how do you do it? And he did, he gave me a really good piece of advice that I think about as a parent and as a spouse. He says, you have to find the moments between the moments. And so, you know, a normal person, it's like, hey, you clock in, you clock out, and then you're home. And if you have a more, um, I don't, what's the word? Uh, consuming career, you have a calling where there isn't that sort of delineation. You have to figure out a way to integrate family and life into the work. That's right. And and that's one of the things that it's always interested me about sort of sports facilities or college or, or or professional is just like the families are around, you know, like they're they're in. This. So yeah, you're not coming home for dinner, but they came after school and they did their homework in your office or whatever. Right. Like you, yeah. you have to find a way to integrate it. And, and I do think in the business world, there is too much, especially for men, too much of a like 
I have a, a professional life and then I have this secret personal life over here. And only when this one is over, do I go here. And by the way, I actually bring a lot of that with me because I'm just on my phone while I'm at That's home. Right. Yeah. So if you're going to, if you're going to be someone who's works a lot and has gone a lot, you have to figure out a way to bring them into what you do and integrate it that way. And, and I, I do think it's important that you also model that behavior. Like, like if the coach or the, the CEO is like, when do they see their family? If people are saying that, then they're then they think they don't have an excuse to see or bring their family. That's right. And and you have to model what that. Coach Carroll did a great job of like uh, once a week family coming in, you know, and hanging out and like at the facility and um, did a great job with that. And so that was supported and valued. And it was not like fourteen hours. You have to stay here until I leave. Yeah. Hey, no, no, no. Go to your kid's game. Yeah. Now, if you're not done, come back now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. but. And then for most people that have this radical profession, they literally, they're seeing their kids. And I recognized it in myself early days, like, I don't know, 15 minutes in the morning mm -hmm. and then like 20 minutes at night. Yeah. So I've got less than an hour relationship per day with my son. Yeah. That's not going to get it done now. No. Like that. that mm -mm. No. So you got to figure out how to reorganize your life and your day around what's act like i heard this great line they're like your kids are not a distraction from your work your kids are your work and so if you think about it that way or you have these two jobs you have your professional job and your kid and you have to go how am i how am i organizing this so one is not being neglected at the expense of the other uh, i'll bring my wife up one more time she says to me, this it. was not not that long ago she says mike you have a really important job and i was like okay cool yeah like, finally i'm being seen <laughs> She says, she says, also, I don't give a shit about what you do for a living. Yeah, right, yeah, no, and she says, it's taking care of me and your son yeah. and this family. And like, and I'm, I have an important job. Yeah. I'm here to take care of you and my, and our son. Yeah. Like, that's a really important job. And if you are traveling the world and not tuning right here, mm -hmm. your job is not working, you know, and it's it has nothing to do with my, my, the, 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 the profession that I'm in. Yeah. And so I just, it was such a grounding moment. I was like, thank you, thank you, thank you, you know? Well, in one of Seneca's letters, he talks about the problem. He says, like, people are really busy. They pursue their career, you know, money, romance, all this stuff. And, and then he says, and then philosophy gets like the leftovers. And he says, it should be the other way around. You're sort of, if we can take philosophy to mean self-development, self-improvement, right. you know, uh, being who you're meant to be as a person. He's like, that should get the main thing. And then the other stuff should get the leftovers. And there can be considerable leftovers, but you, we have the ratio precisely wrong. So in, in elite sport, this is another insight behind the velvet rope. There's only three things as humans we can train. We can train our craft, we can train our body, our mm -hmm. physical carriage, and we can train our mind. Yeah. The best of the best are not leaving the training of the mind up to chance. So training of the mind is not being intellectually um, stimulated. Training of the mind is like, the tools to be focused, the tools that you practice um, to be confident. That's yeah. a, confidence is a skill. Mm -hmm. Being calm is a skill. And it would be a mistake to think that if you don't prepare yourself with the training of those skills, that you would just magically happen. Yeah. It would happen one day. So the the greats do point to a, a uncommon, unreasonable, high standard of training craft, training body, and training mind. And so that's what I think many of us didn't get in grade school, high school, da da da. But athletes do get that, not just athletes, yeah. but in formalized, sophisticated structures, they've got coaches there, like a one to three ratio, and saying and showing them how to train their mind. And the best coaches in modern times are bringing in strength coaches, sports scientists, nutritionists to support yeah. the body and, and brain, and now sports psychologists. Yeah. So they're not trying to do it all in a colloquial way, they're being very sophisticated. Whereas we're not getting that in big business. We're not getting that sure. in, in our professional lives, like inside the rhythm of business of sport in the day, in the hours that you're in the clubhouse, that's where mental training happens. Yeah. And it's actual training. Yeah. It's not like, I think they're going to the sports psych, you know, after I think they're yeah. doing imagery later. Yeah. I don't know. That's 10 years ago. Yeah. What's happening now is inside the rhythm of business. And it's not, the psychologist at the end of the hallway, it's in the agendas of meetings. Yeah, That's how we're getting into it. And I think that that's what's gonna, that's what I wanna ring another bell for in business is that, hey leaders, um, 
you know, people are leaving. Yeah. That's HR, global HRs yeah. will say that. Why are they leaving? Um, they're tired of having the best of them extracted <laughs> for your bonus. Yeah. For Wall Street's gain. Sure. They don't know their kids. They don't know. And they're, they're not doing that anymore. Yeah. So the movement is to go from extracting to unlocking. Sure. So how do, how do, how does the culture and the structure of leadership enhance the unlocking for individuals to have a life that is, has meaning and purpose, and they've got the psychological skills to be their very best, even in high stress moments. There is a human energy crisis that's taking place. People are tired and fatigued and overwhelmed. And that is the, that is the, what'd you call it? The excrement? Excrement. <laughs> excrement from, um, from the extraction model. Sure. Yeah. 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 And, and right. And it's like, hey, look, if your people are getting divorced, if their relationships are taxed, if their health is burning up, they're not going to do a good job. No. Just like you're not going to do a good no, job. No, I, so, I, yeah. I don't. If, yeah. When I'm anxious, yeah. it, it, I'm a bit of a wreck. You yeah. know that. And so, listen, it's not lost on me why I was attracted to this yeah, discipline. Sure. <laughs> like, I needed to figure out the skills and tools, you know, because I can use my mind just fine. But if I don't know how to be present and focused and calm and confident and optimistic, I can't have a love affair with the unfolding moment. Well, I want to talk about Beethoven because I talked about him in Discipline is Destiny. We both sort of locked in on a similar moment, which mm -hmm. is you basically have the most talented, most successful person in the world at what they do. And then the unimaginable thing happens, which is he loses what you would think would be the most fundamental part of doing that thing, or the, the most important asset to doing that thing. And I think, you know, you hear about Beethoven as a kid and you go, oh, Beethoven's this great musician. And then it's hearing... Uh, uh, went away and uh, she just kept doing it. Isn't that so impressive? And it's weird how we kind of skip over just how devastating and terrible that must have been for him as a person. Even more insidious is his dad manipulated his sense of self by um, telling the world that he was younger than he actually was. And dad was oh. a radical alcoholic, raging alcoholic as well. So you can imagine just how unsettled Be young Beethoven was, is that he needed to have everyone believe he was younger, so he'd be a prodigy, and how unstable not only that was, but having an alcoholic father. Yeah. So like it was a bit of a mess growing up. And then he's heralded as the best with an unsettled sense of self. Yeah. It literally was the, the emblem of a performance-based identity. Sure. And then how dare somebody like me, <laughs> you know, like be so perfect in, in, in his craft to lose his hearing. And it was so overwhelming. He was depressed. He was suicidal. Yeah, he writes a suicide note that right. we basically, yeah. that it survived, like that it survives. I mean, I feel like that, that note should be read in schools to it, kids. It's pretty radical. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I have a part of it in, uh, in, uh, in Discipline is Destiny, he says, For six years now, I've been hopelessly afflicted, made worse by the senseless doctors, for year to year deceived with hopes of improvement, finally compelled to face the prospect of a lasting malady whose cure will take years and perhaps be impossible. And it was impossible. He was deluding himself. He said, Though born with a fiery, active temperament, even susceptible to the versions of society, I was soon compelled to withdraw myself to live alone. If at times I was soon compelled to forget all this, oh, how hardly I was flung back by the doubly sad experience of my bad hearing. Yet it was impossible for me to say to people, speak louder, shout, for I am deaf. And he basically was going to kill himself. That's right. And he would pretend for a long time. And he would, <clears throat> so he's a creative genius. Yeah. Okay. So you can get away with a lot when yeah. you've got that, that title, I guess. Yeah. People just thought he was really focused. Yeah. And he would call it something. And I love this. His raptus it, or raptus? Raptus. Yeah. And so he would go into his raptus. So people would say, Sir Beethoven, 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 and, and his friends would be like, oh, is, he's in his raptus. Yes. And he's in his, even though we're walking along, you know, the river. And, and it was a protection mechanism that he was socially deploying. Yes. To, and then when it became just too much, he couldn't hide it. That's when he went away. And that's where he, I'm pointing to, he made a decision. I need to do my music. Yeah. And it's, it's been said, and I don't know if this is the case, but, you know, Beethoven, number five, bum, yeah. bum, 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 that it actually comes from him banging his his fist on the piano. Like, why can't I hear? Yeah. And so what, oh, what is that? And so that was an insight. Like, wow. so that's, 
I'm going to make up some liberties and sure. take some liberties in the story, that that's where he was like, I need to do my music. Mm. I was making music for the world. I need to do my music. Yeah. And that's where number five and and the rest were like some of the best he ever produced. When I think about just sort of, we talk about fortitude, we talk about strength, just the sheer strength strength and character that it takes to get that low and to be that down and to have that taken from you. And he, he claws his way back. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't quit on himself. He doesn't quit on the art. And and that's part, ironically, part of what keeps him going is he, he, he goes, I, I think I do still have more good work in that's right. me. That's and, an optimist. Yes. So fundam- I haven't met a best in the world across multiple disciplines. That's not fundamentally optimistic. They all are. Yeah. Like there's not a best in the world that sees the future being bleak. Yeah. Okay. Like pessimism is, I don't think this is going to work. Yeah. Optimism is, I think something good's going to take place. Well, I've talked about this because the stereotype of the Stoics is like a little resigned, a little down. I mean, Marx really has people that say, oh, it must have been depressing. It must not have smiled a lot. It must not have enjoyed. And I think about his life. I mean, this is a guy... He, he becomes emperor and it's basically like 20 consecutive years of everything that could go wrong, going wrong. There's a plague, there's floods, there's wars. He buries six children, six of his kids die. So half of his children die before reaching adulthood. It's just like one after another. And he's betrayed. Some people think his wife cheats on him. Um, it's a horrible life. Like, And, and he's sick and also... It, it wouldn't have been fun to live in ancient Rome. Like life would have been just hard day to day. Like there would have been not enough heat. It would have been too hot, you know? And, and I'm like, how does he get up every morning? Like, how does he get out of bed? Like, it, again, the, the the greatness of Michael Jordan in the flu game is one thing, but like the person who's depressed, who feels like their life is falling apart, who's lost something or someone, and they keep going and they keep going, not just like for a day, but every day to me, that's, that's also greatness. And it's, as you, as we started earlier, it's harder to celebrate than they scored the most points in the shortest amount of time or, you know, they, they set the scoring record or they ran the fastest time. But that's real greatness, that sort of day-to-day I kept percent. going through. It's just that we don't, we don't honor it because there's not a TV set on it. There's yes. not a microphone in front of it. There's not a re- financial reward. We, we endlessly argue about who's the greatest of all time in whatever sport. Yeah. And we haven't started the conversation, who's the greatest mom? Yeah, sure. Who's the greatest dad? Mm-hmm. Which people herald in a naive kind of like throwaway, like it's the hardest job in the world. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But we don't we don't really reward it. Yes. Right? Like, and so I don't know. I, I'd love to know who the best mom or the best dad in the world is. Well, and it's but and it's we don't know what people are going through. So, you know. We're all going through something. And we're all going through something. Yeah. And yeah. so, so, you know, sometimes that is a tangible or a, a, a identifiable thing. Like someone loses their hearing or someone, you know, is, uh, you know, loses someone they love in an accident. It's very clear, but just you wake up and you feel shitty and you feel down and you don't believe in yourself. And to be able to find a way through that is, that's a form of greatness. Do you lean on anxiety or depression? More anxiety. More anxiety. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. Do you know depression? Yeah. Yeah, like full on depressive episode or like, Le- like less, having some l- sadness that. L- yeah, more like the dy- dysthymic, like just sort of a little bit, but little not bit, like, yeah. but, but yeah, it, it's in, that's the problem with depression, right? Is that like what it actually feels like for the people who are depressed? is ineffable. It's like, we can't, we can't fully understand it. And that's why we're so sort of glib and, right. and, uh, Harden up, toughen yeah, up. Like, exactly. come on. It's, it's the same with addiction. You, look, it's not that you can't talk your way out of it like mm-hmm. that. You have to feel. It seems you're... like you should be able to, no, right. You, Cause they've it, got all these opinions about it. And then you're like, well, let me show you why all those things are incorrect. Yeah. You've got, it run, doesn't make you, a difference. You can try that. You've got running water, this, that, and the other. And, and that actually makes a depressed person feel worse because now, now they don't they have say, a reason. Yeah. They say, well, you're right. I should be happy, but I'm telling you something's mm-hmm. not right. Yeah. And so the, the thing about, um, feeling deep, even experiences of depression, it's actually really important. The thing mm-hmm. about a depressive episode or a disorder of depression is that they're stuck in it. Mm. So that's one of the reasons that I think many of us are afraid to do that. To like, 
if you if you didn't experience nighttime, you wouldn't know how to experience daytime, right? Sure. Like, so the the yin yang, the equal opposites, the 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 valley and the in the mountains, whatever. So we need both to understand. Yeah. And it's the problem with the disorder is that they're stuck in it and mm-hmm. they don't know how to climb back out or yeah. get out of it. But it's really important for us if you really want joy, you've got to understand deep sadness. Mm-hmm. And it's like in some respects the grief that comes as the after effect of um, a death one, it can help you understand that just a little bit. Sure. As long as you don't kind of just do the Irish. Um, I got Irish and Italian in me. So like, you know, which is laugh, tell stories, drink and, you know, and and cry at the same time. But like understanding the depths of both anxiety and depression is a, is a powerful tool. If you want to really understand what you're capable of. Yeah. You do also. Yeah. Okay. Get in your ice tub. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> Why not go to the depths of sadness? Oh, yeah. wait, that's too hard. You're going to macho up, you know, and do the ice bath. Come on. I mean, sure. like, you know, you're going to grind through that. It's crazy. It Honestly, the the biggest part, yes, there's physiological benefits of an ice bath, period. Yeah. That's good. You know what the opportunity in that that I see as a psychologist is the walk to the ice bath is where you meet yourself. Huh. Once you get into the ice, you have another opportunity to meet yourself. Yeah, you got three minutes, you're just sitting there. What do you do at that time? The moment that you get in and you have the shock response, you meet yourself in that moment. Are you trying yeah. to escape? Sure. Or do you settle in and be in it? Sure. Yeah. So it's the walk to, it's the first few seconds. And then when you're actually in it, are you trying to leave or can you be with yourself in a hard and harsh environment? So there's as much a psychological play as there is physiological in that experience. Well, I would argue that the physiological stuff is is hopefully it's true, <laughs> you know, and 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 we're seems in a cycle. like the, we're in a yeah, cycle right it's, now. It's, it seems yeah. like it'll be vetted, but we don't know, mm-hmm. right? But even if it isn't true, it's still beneficial if you're using the walk there and the walk back and the three minutes and you're and the just you're you're wrestling with that part of you that says I don't want to do that thing. It's hard. That's right. And you say, I'm going to do that thing because it's hard. And then you get in and it's it's hard and your mind wants to wander. You want to check the clock and to go, I'm going to, pr- what I'm going to practice here is being in control of what I'm thinking about. Or uh, aware. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. East, West, different. <laughs> but but there's different, appro- different, uh, my word choice is probably operative. But the point is, yeah. Hey, I'm, am I going to actually think about those thoughts and decide yes. what they mean? Or am I just going to? Am I going to be lost in what's happening, which is unpleasant and cold? Or am I going to be thinking about how this looks on social media or all this other shit? And and there's a danger in it when you're in a harsh, difficult, cold environment in this case. And I labeled it harsh, but a cold environment. Yeah. And your reflexive nature is to escape. And let's say you're doing that. I got to get out of here. What am I doing? I got This is sucks. I got to get. And so now you're pairing, let's call it. Um, low-level thinking, escapism, re- desire for relief yeah. with harsh, hardness, difficult environments. Yeah. So now when you're entering, you're pairing and training. When I'm in a difficult environment, I'm training myself to try to escape. Yeah, that's just a shitty experience. They didn't learn anything It's actually that. really yeah. bad because yeah. the unlock happens when you settle in, yeah. you make a decision to be in it yeah. and, to, and to have a love affair with the unfolding moment. So, yeah. so like we're not, we're taught, we're like, we're, <laughs> We're still in the stone ages in so many ways. Go do the hard thing and yeah. suck it up. You know, it's all of the little nuanced, delicate tenderness that happens with the awareness of what's actually happening. Sure. And pairing an aware mind, a guided mind in a hostile, rugged, difficult environment. That That's the path of mastery. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be in an ice bath. You can also do it as you walk to get your hair cut or, that's you know what right. I mean? You can, yeah. you can find that. You can practice that skill, that exercise, that sort of uh, getting in touch with yourself or being present or whatever. You can do that anywhere and everywhere. 100%. Yeah. This is amazing, man. Thanks. I'm so stoked to hang with you. <laughs> Anytime. Yeah, yeah that's really well, I, lo- I loved the book. I'm glad you did it. And uh, Thank you. It's great. I appreciate you.